This is one of my favourite photos of me underwater. Uh, this was taken by Kevin Denlay, who's a seasoned technical diver. I, you know, I, I can't do this uh, podium thing. It feels like running for President of the United States, which, which would be a great honour to do, but uh, I'm not eligible, so I'll come down here. On, can you, you can hear me anyway, can't you? I just, I, I, the podium thing doesn't really work. Um, this is a little, little wreck called the Jennifer Kay off Brisbane uh, in 80 metres of water. There's a few people in this room who've dived it. This is me on a Mark 15 5 rebreather, and it kind of exemplifies the kind of diving that the rebreathers have opened up to us. It, you could do this dive on open circuit, would, it would be a lot more difficult. So this kind of speaks to, this slide speaks to the stuff that I've already said and what we were going to talk about, uh, and my final comments on safety challenges and how I really do not want to give the impression in talking about them that I think rebreathing is an inappropriate thing to do, it's just that we are a responsible community so we're going to address these things. So the first question to ask is what is a rebreather? And at the simplest level, a rebreather is breathing in and out of a bag, minus the glue. You wouldn't tend to use that. You can do this. If you're going to breathe in and out of a bag, then two bad things are going to happen. You're going to deplete the oxygen in the bag and carbon dioxide that you, that you produce from metabolizing the oxygen will build up. And the corollary to that is that if you're going to breathe in and out of a bag, you have to do two things. You have to remove the carbon dioxide and you have to replace the oxygen that you metabolize. And it's interesting, and I'm sure you'll all agree, that there's not much room for error in performing those functions. So that's what rebreathers have to do, and they have to do it accurately and well. So I want to develop my model of breathing in and out of a bag a little bit further. So here's the bag and a tube and, and the arrows indicate breathing in and out of it. Now I struggled to find a picture of a model that looked sick enough to just be breathing in and out of a bag. But I came up with this one uh, courtesy of Dr. Pollock. Uh, and I, when I used this photo not that long ago, someone from the audience came up to me and said, you know, it's very disrespectful to use a photograph of somebody who's dead. <laughs> and uh, as you'll find out later on in this, this uh, weekend, this person isn't dead. He's one of the presenters who's here, and he'll be talking to you. And your challenge is to identify that person who looks a little bit different uh, in his normal daily life. So you are breathing in and out of a bag, but in fact you do it around a circle. So rebreathers form a circle circuit, and the thing that allows that to happen is a mouthpiece with one-way valves that ensures that the flow through the circuit is unidirectional, and make no mistake, you're breathing in and out of a bag, but you're doing it around a circle. There's our model, just to make sure you understand where the mouthpiece is. Um, so you're breathing around a circle, and these mouth, this mouthpiece with one-way valves ensures that the flow is unidirectional, and right there, right there, you have the first of the sort of unique things about a rebreather that can present a hazard or can fail. These one-way valves are prone to failure, and if that happens, then the unilateral flow is lost and a number of problems can arise from that. You'll recall I said that if you're going to breathe in and out of a bag, you have to remove the CO2 and replace the oxygen. Now, removing the CO2 is the relatively simple part. What we do for that is we place a CO2 scrubbing canister with soda lime in it in the exhale limb of the loop. Soda lime is a compound mixture of uh, calcium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, and a few other things, and essentially it, mix, it, it interacts with the carbon dioxide and removes it. And there, again, is another unique feature of rebreathers that has the potential for causing problems. Carbon dioxide scrubber has a finite absorbing capacity. It doesn't last forever, so you have to replace it periodically and at the right times. These scrubbers, depending on their design, are potentially prone to packing errors, so the way that you put the, the scrubber material into the scrubber and also to installation errors, installing it in the rebreather. Sometimes that can be done incorrectly. If you do that, then the CO2 may not be removed adequately. And the second thing that the rebreather must do is replace the oxygen that you remove as you're breathing in and out of the bag. This is a more complex process, and in fact, there are multiple ways in which it can be done. 
and it is the oxygen replacement technique that is used to define rebreathers. At the simplest level, you can have what we would refer to as a pure oxygen rebreather. So in this setting, you have a cylinder of oxygen, uh, and for, for simplicity, I've left the oxygen regulators, the pressure regulator off these oxygen, so all the cylinders in my diagrams, but these are pressure regulated cylinders, and this is connected to a demand valve. I also don't wish to represent all of these components as actually being inside the counter lung or the bag, but just for the sake of clarity in my diagrams, that's where I put them. So what happens here is you've got pure oxygen in the rebreather. As you consume the oxygen, the volume falls, and it will activate this demand valve and bleed more oxygen in. The same thing occurs as you descend and the pressure increases, it compresses the bag, and of course, if that happens, you won't be able to breathe, and so the demand valve will open and introduce more oxygen into the unit. And most of them also have a manual addition system so you can push a button and add oxygen if you want to. That is the simplest rebreather. But of course, there's an obvious problem with that, and all of you will know that, that when you're breathing pure oxygen, you're very depth limited. So there's the, you can't take these devices very deep. They are used, they're used mainly by the military for shallow attack swimming, but not very often in the recreational community. The second style of rebreather, based on its oxygen addition system, is what we call a semi-closed rebreather. And in that setting, we have a single cylinder of, and, and I should preface this by saying that there are multiple types of semi-closed rebreathers. I'm trying to be generic here. If I don't include a design that exactly corresponds to the rebreather you, you use, please don't be offended. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to pick one out here. I'm just trying to be simple and generic. So you have a single cylinder that contains an oxygen enriched mixture such as nitrox in the usual circumstance. And the idea is that the oxygen is bled into the rebreather circle at a constant rate at all depths, regulated by what we call a constant mass flow regulator. And that's designed to introduce that gas with its oxygen content at a rate that maintains a predictable and appropriate level of oxygen in the loop at all times. Now, of course, that of itself is not going to preserve the loop volume as you descend and the counter lung or the bag gets compressed. So you also, in these devices, have a demand valve which can respond to the bag being compressed or emptied for any reason. And these also have a manual bypass, which I have omitted for simplicity. They're often referred to as semi-closed because the amount of gas you've got to have flowing in there is such that it usually produces an overfilling of the, of the loop and it needs to bleed off periodically. So these units produce bubbles and, and, and they're not completely closed circuits, so they're often called, called semi-closed. The problem with these is that although the flow of gas into the unit is designed to produce a predictable level of oxygen, the reality is that you're not absolutely certain what it is unless you add an oxygen monitoring system. It can be variable, it varies with your workload, for example, and it is prone to changing with depth, particularly during ascent. So you have to be very careful ascending with the pressure decreasing and the PO2 decreasing when you're using these units. The next kind of oxygen replacement system is what we refer to as a manual closed circuit rebreather. And you can see that as we go from, each, from system to system, we're increasing levels of complexity. So in this setting, what we've done is we've separated out the oxygen supply from the gas that dilutes the oxygen. So we have a cylinder of pure oxygen, and again, you have a constant mass flow regulator or something akin to it which trickles a small amount of oxygen into the unit, into the loop constantly. And that's designed to be sufficient to keep you alive even if you didn't do anything else. But it's probably not sufficient to keep the loop oxygen level at optimum levels for decompression, for example. You have to do that yourself. So you have a manual addition system. You can top the oxygen up as is appropriate. And of course, if you're going to do that, you need an oxygen monitoring system. So these units have oxygen fuel cells in them, galvanic fuel cells, which are connected to a PO2 display. 
These cells are like oxygen-powered batteries. They produce a current that's directly proportional to the oxygen, to the PO2 that they're exposed to. And that can be read out on this display, allowing the user to top up the oxygen using a manual addition button. Then, of course, you have to remember that we're not using pure oxygen here. We're diluting the oxygen with a diluent gas. Now, the diluent gas can be different for different situations, but for a relatively shallow nitrox dive, you might use uh, a diluent of, uh, you might use air as your diluent, so that you're going to be mixing oxygen with air to bring the PO2 up or the fraction of oxygen up so that you're breathing nitrox. If you're diving deeper, you would probably choose a diluent that contains a helium mix, probably a trimix, with an amount of oxygen that's appropriate to the depth of your dive. And I'm going to talk about the selection of diluent a little bit later in this presentation, so we'll leave it there. And the diluent is added by a demand valve so that as you descend, the bag gets compressed, the diluent gets added, and there will also be a manual bypass with these units as well. The interesting thing about this, type, this style of rebreather is that the normal operation, and when I say normal operation, I mean the maintenance of, a, of the ideal PO2 does rely on the diligence of the diver. So you've got to be watching what your PO2 is and you've got to be adjusting it yourself. Whereas the life support function is relatively simple. This unit's going to trickle oxygen into the unit at a rate that should keep you alive no matter what, uh, without you having to think about it. One of the points I want to make here, and this applies to the next kind of rebreather I'm going to talk about too, is that the weakest link in all of these units that measure oxygen levels are these cells. It's an imperfect technology for our purposes and they are prone to failure. And clearly, if there's failure in the oxygen levels that you're measuring or an inaccuracy in the oxygen levels, then that is potentially a serious problem. The final type of rebreather is what we refer to as an electronic closed circuit rebreather. Now this is another step up in complexity. So what happens here is we don't have a constant trickle of oxygen into the loop. What we do is we rely on these oxygen fuel cells to measure the oxygen accurately. They pass their information to a microprocessor and you have told that microprocessor what pressure of oxygen you want to breathe throughout the dive. And when the PO2 in the loop falls below that level, then it opens an electronic solenoid valve which bleeds oxygen into the loop and restores the loop PO2. And when that happens, the solenoid valve closes. Of course, there is a PO2 display so that you can watch what's happening. And some units have one that's linked to the microprocessor and others have an additional PO2 display that is independent of the microprocessor. And of course, just like the manual closed circuit rebreather, you have a cylinder of diluent, which is chosen on the same basis. I've omitted the manual addition feeds from this diagram just for the sake of simplicity, but all of these devices allow you to add oxygen manually and add diluent manually if the situation arises when you need to. The normal operation of these units requires little diver input. Now, I, what I mean by that is, now I'm not saying you shouldn't have input, but you could get away with not having input if it's working properly. The amazing thing about these units is you can put them on your back and you can swim underwater and you could forget about it and if nothing goes wrong with the rebreather, the likelihood is you'll be just fine. But the life support function is complex and the difficulty with these devices is that they work so well that they foster complacency. It's easy to swim around, get preoccupied with another task like taking a photograph and forget entirely that you've got a very complex life support system on your back that needs to be watched carefully. It's not a criticism, it's just an observation. These are the devices I use. And there are many failure points. So we'll come back a little bit to the safety issues around these rebreathers later, but they are complex devices and you have to be very cautious in using them. This is an example of, a, of a closed circuit re an electronic closed circuit rebreather. This is a military device, US Navy Mark 16. 
Uh, the, I don't know if I, you probably can't see this pointer, but the counter lung, the bag that you breathe in and out of, and the CO2 scrubber are contained in this center section here. There's the diluent cylinder, there's the oxygen cylinder, there's a pod there that contains the microprocessor and the battery. The solenoid valve is buried down in the plumbing in there somewhere. The hoses are up here. And this is just to show you some of the components that I've been speaking about diagrammatically. And this photo shows a few other features that I also mentioned uh, but didn't have photos of. So there's a PO2 display there which is connected to the microprocessor. There's another PO2 display independent of the microprocessor. Most of these units these days also have a head-up display which is an LED based display that essentially gives you a in your face indication of what's going on in your loop at all times. So the idea is that it makes you diligent by having it there, you can't ignore it. So green is good, flashing is, is something you need to sort something out, red is bad, get off the loop. They all have a different, slightly different algorithm but that's what they're there for. And another safety feature that many of these units have these days is what we call a bailout valve where the mouthpiece is connected into an open circuit gas supply so that you can switch onto open circuit with just the flick of a switch without having to remove the mouthpiece from your mouth to change breathing sources. Okay, so, so why bother with all of this? What, you know, it's complex technology. What's the big deal? Why do we bother? Well, by way of example, this is a, a, a few years ago, uh, well actually this is going back a wee way, 2002, a scientific organisation in Australia was doing side scan sonar surveys off the uh, New South Wales coast and they found this that looked like a shipwreck. And they thought it might be a historic shipwreck called the Cumberland, but the depth was 300 feet, 90 meters. Too deep for them, too deep for the, uh, for the police and military, and it would have presented a number of occupational safety and health issues to dive it professionally. At that time, I was diving with a group of wreck divers called the Sydney Project, and we were known for diving between depths of sort of 80 to 140 meters. We were doing quite a lot of deep stuff at that time. And these scientific guys brought this thing to us and they said, look at this, we've found this trace and it, you know, it looks like a shipwreck and you know what, you can actually see the exact position here are the GPS coordinates here. And they left us that and they said, their parting shot was, well, what you do with that information is entirely up to you. <laughs> no, knowing that within five picoseconds we would be heading off down there to dive it. So here we go, we've got a challenge, a 90 meter, 300 foot dive. We want to spend 20 minutes on this wreck to have a look around it and see if we can find anything that identifies it. Is it the Cumberland? So let's look at how you might approach that if you're an open circuit diver. First of all, I want to convince you, if you aren't already convinced, that strapping a whole lot of air on your back and going down to 90 meters ain't a good idea. I think you all know this. I think the narcotic effect would incapacitate you, the narcotic effect of nitrogen. Decompression on air is inefficient. Air only contains 20% oxygen. It would take you a long time to decompress from a very deep dive, breathing 20% oxygen. If you breathe air at 90 meters or 10 atmospheres, 300 feet, 10 atmospheres, the pressure of inspired oxygen would be 2.1 atmospheres. That's toxic level of oxygen when you're diving. So that's no good. 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen is often considered an advisable maximum to be breathing underwater. And the gas density would be about 13 grams per litre. So your worker breathing would be very high. I'll talk a lot about gas density when I do give my physiology lecture this afternoon. But 8 grams per litre is often considered an advisable maximum. So to do this dive you need a helium based mix for the deep phase of the dive to mitigate some of these risks. Helium's non-narcotic, it's light, it's not dense, so it's a much better gas for these sorts of dives. Now all of you, you trained divers, you've seen this kind of diagram before, and the point I want to make is that when you're down at 90 meters and you exhale one liter of gas, by the time it gets to the surface it's 10 liters of gas. So if you're going to do this on open circuit, you're going to use a lot of that very expensive helium. Now I know in the United States you're very privileged, you can buy these big cylinders of helium for a few hundred bucks. Let me tell you that in Australia and New Zealand a, a G cylinder of helium costs about a thousand dollars. It's a lot of money to be doing open circuit helium diving. So let's, let's, let's put that to one side though and say okay we're going to go and do this dive on open circuit. The first thing you need to do is choose what gases you're going to use. So what gas are we going to choose to breathe at the bottom? Well, 
You ask yourself, how much oxygen can I breathe? You want to breathe as much as you can because the more oxygen you're breathing, the less inert gas you're absorbing, so that's a good thing. So we say we're going to breathe 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen and at 10 atmospheres total pressure, that gives us an oxygen percentage of 13%. So we're going to use 13% oxygen. And the next question you ask is, how much nitrogen are we going to have in this mix? And people often figure that out by saying, well, how much nitrogen and how much narcosis and am I prepared to tolerate on an air dive? And many people might say, well, I dive to air on 40 metres and I feel pretty good, that's about as far as I'd like to go. So you can do the maths and 40% nitrogen gives you the same level of narcosis at 10 atmospheres as an air dive to 40 metres. So we'll have 40% nitrogen and the rest will be helium. And that's designated trimix, 10, uh, sorry, trimix 13, 47. So 13% oxygen, 47% helium, balanced nitrogen. And then you would say, well, what are we going to decompress on? Because you can't breathe that all the way to the surface. It's a hypoxic gas and you wouldn't decompress very efficiently. So on the way to the surface, we'll change to say, now look, I know there's lots of ways of doing this and some of you would have different approaches to this, but we'll change to nitrox 36. That's 36% 36, 36 oxygen, balanced nitrogen. And we can start breathing that at 27 metres because that's where the PO2 will be 1.3 atmospheres. And we'll use oxygen from six metres for our final decompression. So those are our gases. The next thing you do is plug those gases into some form of decompression algorithm. This is Kevin Gurr's uh, VGM platform. And it will spit out a decompression algorithm for you. And uh, here it is here, just so that you can read it a bit more easily. So these are your depths down here, 90 metres. Sorry about the metres. I, I forget that I'm in a country that still works in furlongs and cubits and stuff like that. But, but um, 90 metres, 300 feet. And these are your, your depths and your stop times. And the white is your bottom gas, so the 1347. We change at 27 metres to nitrox 36 and then oxygen at six meters and the total run time is just over two and a quarter hours. That's our decompression plan. You take that decompression plan and you start figuring out what gas you're gonna need. This is a process that many of you will have been through, I know that, but there are some of you in here who probably haven't. So you generate tables like this where you list out your depths and the ambient pressure and the times you're gonna spend at those depths and your surface air consumption rate. That's something that people who train as technical divers figure out for themselves very early in their careers. They figure out how much gas they use swimming at the surface when they're swimming gently, like a typical dive, and also when they're at rest, say on decompression. And then you can use those numbers and extrapolate them to different depths using this kind of table. And then you multiply the ambient pressure by the time by the surface air consumption rate, you get a total volume of gas in liters, you add all that up, and then you multiply it by a safety factor, say 1.3, and you get a final number. 7,800 litres of bottom mix is what we're going to need. Okay, it's quite a lot of gas. And then you do the same for your nitrox 36 and your oxygen. You don't need so much of those. Same math, same process. And then you sort of figure out how you're going to put all that together. So you need to carry a lot of gas. <laughs> and, and that's one of the big problems with open so it's. As you're going to hear me say, when you dive on a rebreather, you have to carry almost similar amounts of gas for the decompression in case your rebreather fails, but the, lo the li likelihood is you're not going to use it, so you save a lot of money. You don't necessarily cut down on having to carry the cylinders, not quite as many as you see here, of course. Another problem with open circuit scuba, and this is an important one as a rebreather diver who doesn't like to spend lots of time being jerked around on an anchor line out in midwater being shark bait, is that it takes longer to decompress. And the reason for that is that you're not breathing the optimal PO2 at each depth you're decompressing at. So what I've shown here on the, the y-axis is the pressure of inspired oxygen. And remember I've said the optimal PO2 for our dive is 1.3 atmospheres. And what I've shown on the x-axis is your depth as you decompress. So there's 90 meters or 300 feet right at the bottom. And these are all your decompression stops. And look, we've optimized our bottom mix so that you're breathing 1.3 atmospheres at the bottom, right here. That's great, that's what we want. 
But the minute we start ascending, the PO2 starts falling until we change to our nitrox 36, it goes back up to 1.3, but then we start ascending again and it starts falling again and it doesn't become optimal again until we get onto our oxygen at six meters. It goes above 1.3 briefly at six meters, but when you're at rest on decompression, we accept that that's probably fine. So you're not breathing the optimal PO2 at each stage during the decompression when you're on open circuit. Now look, I agree, you could carry more cylinders of different gas and fill this gap in here a little bit, but every time you do that, you're adding another cylinder to what you're carrying. So how does a rebreather help with all of this? Well, rebreathers have a couple of advantages that I haven't kind of alluded to yet. They don't produce bubbles, or not many in most cases. The gas you're breathing is warm and humidified. But the point, the, the key point is that they minimize gas consumption. And that's important for deep dives when you're using this expensive helium. I said 7,800 7, litres, didn't I? Look, in theory, all you need for a rebreather dive to that depth is the loop volume, I don't know, 10 litres, times the pressure that you're going to, 10 atmospheres, 100 litres of helium. You could almost get away with that. Now, in reality, you use a lot more diluent than that because you go up and down a bit and and that consumes diluent, and many people use diluent in their wings, or their not, not often not their dry suits, depending on what the diluent is, but you use more than that. But in theory, you use tiny amounts of diluent. So the rebreather is a big advantage in this regard. And look, here's another photo from that wreck I showed you before. And this is me on my Mark 15.5, and, and uh, you see no bubbles. And here's an open circuit diver. And there's about five bucks worth of helium on its way to the surface there. Uh, I might use five bucks worth of, uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I might use five bucks worth of helium for the whole dive. So that, you know, there's no question that they are conservative of gas. The other advantage that I've added at the bottom here is that with a rebreather, you are breathing the optimal mix for decompression at all stages during the ascent. I showed you this diagram before. This is the situation for open circuit scuba. But look, with a rebreather, you tell the rebreather, a close, an electronic closed circuit rebreather, you tell it, I want to breathe 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen. So this is what you breathe the entire period of the dive, 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen. And that's because the rebreather keeps adding oxygen to get the PO2 up to the preordained set point. So in fact, I should point out that breathing 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen constantly like that does marginally increase the, the risk of oxygen toxicity, but I mean that's something that we take into account and cope with. The way, the way the rebreather does it, and this is just to illustrate this concept of constant PO2 diving, what's changing is the fraction of oxygen in your mix. So at 300 feet or the bottom, we're breathing 13% oxygen, and as we come back towards the surface, the PO2 stays the same, but the fraction of oxygen in the mix increases and the rebreather is doing that for you. Or you're doing it manually if you're on an MCCR. You can optimize your PO2 at every point during your decompression. And this is a good example of that. This is a, a, a recording of one of my dives uh, in a cold water lake in New Zealand. It was an 80 meter dive. Uh, and this is the depth here, the depth profile of the dive. Uh, and this trace here is the PO2. And I have, I've put in, you can't read the scale, but that's the PO2 set point was 1.3, and you can see the rebreather has done a pretty good job of maintaining my PO2 at 1.3 atmospheres during the dive. The interesting thing is, there's a little bit of waviness around this line. The reason for that is that the solenoid puffs oxygen in, and that sort of reaches the cells in a slightly unmixed form, so it causes these little spikes around the mean of 1.3. You can see that those spikes are maximal while I'm working on the bottom and during ascent, because during ascent, the PO2 in the loop is falling, so the rebreather is working to bring the PO2 up. So there's a little bit more spike activity, but as you level out on the decompression and stop working, it becomes a bit more of a smooth line. These two dips here correspond to these little ascents, but you can see the rebreather corrects that pretty fast. Just here, I went on to open circuit oxygen for various reasons, uh, I won't describe that, but uh, it wasn't a problem with the rebreather, it was something that I did intentionally, went on to open circuit oxygen here, so the rebreather fell down to its surface set point, which I switched it to. So 
there you go, that's, that's how they maintain these PO2s. Interestingly, that dive was done uh, in, uh, in a search for this. This is a, the engine off a helicopter that uh, crashed into Lake Wanaka in the south, south Island of New Zealand a few years ago. The engine became separated from the mainframe of the helicopter. They managed to retrieve the, the mainframe with the pilot in it using a remote operated vehicle but they couldn't get a line on the engine, they wanted it back, so they asked Pete Mesley and I to go down and try and find this engine. You can see that the depth here on the ROV image was 74 meters. And when they asked me, when they asked me if we would go down and do this, they said, well, well you know, what do you need? What, what, what do we need to provide? And I said, well, we're, we're gonna need a boat where it needs to be big enough for two rebreather divers and cylinders and a few extra people to help us out and, you know, shot lines and boys. And they said, like a big runabout would, you know, would do the job. So we turned up on the day and this is what they bought for surface support. And um, I, I was not expecting an aircraft carrier. And I, and I, took, a, I took a look at this thing because the, the helicopter is actually out here somewhere, you know, so we're going to be offshore. And, and I looked at this thing and I, th and I could envisage myself jumping off it, but getting back on board would be a bit of a problem. And I pointed this out to the guy who'd, brought this thing along and he said, oh, well, you see that front end loader on the back? And I said, yes. And he said, well, next thing you know, I'm sitting in the front of this thing and uh, I can tell you I've gotten out of the water in some unique ways in my time, but this really was the most incredible of them. Uh, a very unusual event. So, look, to finish off, um, what I'm going to do now is walk you through uh, the anat what I call the anatomy of a rebreather dive. So just a a brief look at some of the things about running, the logistics of running a rebreather dive that make it a little bit different to open circuit. And we're going to keep going with, our, with, the, with the theme that I've had so far, that it's a, a, a closed circuit rebreather dive to 90 meters or 300 feet for, for 20 minutes. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of planning and executing a dive like this. So we, we, just, we could talk about that all day. But I'm just going to focus on some of those interesting things from a CCR point of view. So obviously, there's logistics and, and you know the boat you choose, the people you have, the support that you have. This is Pete and I on a on a on a similar dive uh, in another location. But look, let's go through some of the key decisions you've got to make. The first thing you're going to do is decide what set point you're going to use for your dive. So how, what you're going to tell the rebreather that you want to breathe in terms of the pressure of oxygen. Or if you're using an MCCR, what pressure of oxygen you're going to maintain. And there's a few things that go into that decision. So the first thing you would do is consult a decompression algorithm and the oxygen exposure tables and marry those two up. How long is our dive going to be? And is this a safe oxygen exposure? It's always a trade-off between decompression efficiency and the risk of oxygen toxicity. But the the, the, the resolution I would come to for a 90 meter dive for 20 minutes would be that a PO2 of 1.3 atmospheres is fine because our dive is going to be about two, two and a quarter hours long and the exposure limit for oxygen is about 180 minutes at 1.3 atmospheres. So that will use a PO2 of 1.3. Then you need to choose a diluent gas. That's a, it's actually quite a complex process. When you break it down, it actually turns out that the diluent you choose can be quite similar to the bottom gas that you would choose for an open circuit dive. The first thing, the key thing is, we always have oxygen in our diluent gas, so in case you have to breathe it at any point. But the oxygen content, think about this, the oxygen content mustn't be such that at the bottom, it would exceed the PO2 set point of your rebreather because otherwise you won't be able to get your PO2 down to the level you want. For example, if you had 20% oxygen in your diluent gas for a 90 meter dive to 10 atmospheres, when you got down to the bottom, the PO2 just from your diluent, which is supposed to dilute the oxygen, would be two atmospheres, 10 times 0.2, 10 times 20%. So that would be no good. That's why you have a hypoxic diluent. So that's why we're going to use our 13% that we would have used for open circuit. And, and similar to the choice of an open circuit bottom gas, the nitrogen content mustn't produce more narcosis than you're prepared to tolerate at that depth. So we could use our Nitrox 13, our Trimix 1347 that we decided to use for an open circuit dive. Many rebreather divers would choose 
a diluent known as Trimix 1050, or more correctly, Heli Air 1050. It's one of the great conveniences of technical diving that if you add equal parts air and helium, you get a mixture of 1050, 10% oxygen, 50% helium, and 40% nitrogen. So that's 1050. And many people would do that just for the convenience, the ease of the blending. But something along those lines for our diluent. You would plan bailout gas requirements. I don't think there are many rebreather divers who use rebreathers without bailout gas. In other words, a gas that you can go onto, open circuit gas, if your rebreather fails. And you would use a similar process to those tables that we used for planning our open circuit gas requirements for that purpose. One of the caveats on that is that I talked about the surface air consumption rates that you use for planning an open circuit dive. If you bail out from a rebreather, it's usually because you've got some problem with the rebreather. And if you have a problem, it's likely that you're breathing heavily, particularly if it's a carbon dioxide problem. So when you're planning bailout, you need to bear in mind that the surface air consumption rates might be much higher than you think. Then you need to mix and analyze and label your gases and reanalyze them and be totally and utterly anal retentive about this process because the related errors in this area are a major cause of accidental deaths in rebreather divers and in open circuit divers also. Then you assemble your rebreather. And look, I, I just can't emphasize this enough. This is where you need to be, like if we were all Swiss or all German, we would be good at this, right? Because they are the most culturally, the most focused anal retentive people in the world. I mean, don't, if there's any Swiss or Germans in there, I actually mean it as a compliment. I, you know, I'm in a profession where I have to be anal retentive all the time. I wish I had the same characteristics as the average Swiss or German for attention to detail. You need meticulous attention to detail, no shortcuts, never rush, a methodical standardized approach that you don't change from time to time. And use checklists, use checklists. I wanna point this study out to you. Um, look, if any one of us today, Nick, if you got appendicitis, you'd go to hospital, right? You'd have an operation. Grant, if, you, if, 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 you, if your heart valve in your, in your heart started leaking, you needed a, a valve replacement. You'd go to hospital, you'd have surgery. You would go to a 21st century operating theater and expect that they would do a job on you with no mistakes because this is first world country and it's the 21st century and things, mistakes don't get made in operating theaters, right? This is a study I was involved in. This is 2009, published in the New England Journal of Medicine where we introduced a surgical safety checklist to operating theatre practice. We monitored outcomes for 4,000 patients before and after the introduction of the checklist. The introduction of a checklist, a basic safety checklist in 21st, operating theater, 21st century operating theatres halved mortality and halved the rate of complications. Check that out. These this is in an environment where you would expect mistakes don't get made. Well, they do get made, and they get made in assembling rebreathers, a similarly complex technical activity. So you need to use checklists. They can take many forms. They can be written, they can be electronic, and I'm not gonna go any further with this. I wanted to get that message across, but Richie Kohler's gonna talk more about checklists over the next couple of days. So then you assemble your rebreather. And that typically involves packing and installing the scrubber, checking the one-way valves, making sure they're working, putting the thing together, doing a positive and negative pressure check. That's a way of uh, uh, checking the integrity of the loop to make sure that it's not leaking. Check your diluent pressures, your oxygen pressures, switch the rebreather on, calibrate the sensors, pre-breathe the scrubber. If you breathe on the unit for five minutes and you don't get short of breath and you feel fine and everything seems to be working and the oxygen, oxygen addition system seems to be working, that's a great thing. Why wouldn't you do that before you jump in the water and trust that it's all happening before descending straight down? Pre-breathe the unit. And if you're not gonna use it straight away, shut it down and isolate it. So at the start of a dive, a final check. Make sure your cylinders are on and they're open. Believe it or not, 
rebreather, having your rebreather switched off or one or both of your cylinders switched off or not even full has been a factor in many accidents. You usually start with a PO2 set point of 0.7 or something around that because if you had your PO2 set at 1.3 atmospheres at the surface and you switched your rebreather on, it would start going add oxygen, add oxygen, add oxygen in a futile attempt to bring the PO2 up to 1.3, but at the surface, one atmosphere, it can't do that. So you start with a lower PO2 set point. Make sure your mouthpiece is closed when it's out of your mouth. If you're in the water and your mouthpiece is open and not in your mouth, all the gas floods out of the loop, it loses buoyancy, and in fact, if the mouthpiece goes in the water, it can flood. That, you don't have to think about that on open circuit. You can take your mouthpiece out, put it back in, take it out, put it in, blow air rings, put it back in. With a rebreather, you can't do that. Much more complex. The surface is a dangerous place with rebreathers. This is a place where problems first become apparent, if there are some, and there are lots of distractions, people jumping in, people needing help, there's exertion, there might be some current at the back of the boat. It's a dangerous place. One of the things we often do during the first part of the descent, check each other for leaks. And on a rebreather, you have to think about things that you don't have to think about on open circuit, like keeping the rebreather bag at a relatively empty level so that when you breathe in, you just bottom it out. We call that minimum loop volume. And the reason for that is if your loop is full of gas, it's, you're very buoyant. Your buoyancy changes with, with the volume of the counter length. So minimum loop volume. Your buoyancy is very poor, buoyancy control is poor if you don't do that. And then there are recurrent task loads during descent, and I'm contrasting open circuit and rebreather divers here. With open circuit, think about it. We've all done open circuit descents. What do you do? You're going down, you adjust your buoyancy, you add a little bit of gas to your dry suit, you check your, 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 your clear ears. Buoyancy, dry suit, ears, buoyancy, dry suit, ears, watch your depth maybe. Be a bit situationally aware, where's my buddy, what's going on? With a rebreather, it's more complex. You've got to check your, uh, adjust your buoyancy, put a bit of gas in your dry suit, do your ears, check your PO2, maybe add a little bit of diluent to the counter lung if it's bottoming out as you're descending quickly. You need to be situationally aware in ways that go beyond that for open circuit scuba. Not only where is my buddy, but is my solenoid firing right? Is there some funny noises coming from my rebreather? Can I hear this little bit of gurgling? There's a whole lot of little nuances about rebreather diving that you have to be so much more aware of in comparison to open circuit scuba. During the typical descent on open circuit for a technical dive, you probably need to make a gas switch at some point, and that is, that is sort of equ equated to the need to change your set. Remember I said we start with a set point of 0.7 atmospheres of oxygen at the start of the dive. At some point, you need to change that to 1.3. We usually do that when we first get to the bottom. So when you, f when you arrive at the bottom, it's a good idea to just sit there for a minute, not sort of suddenly take your camera and start taking photos, but just sit there and make sure everything's fine. Change your set point. Oh, it, it, most of us will open our bailout valve and just take one or two breaths from it to make sure it's working. And then change your set point. If you don't do this and your decompression computer is not plugged in to the actual PO2 of your circuit, so your computer thinks you're breathing 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen, but you're actually breathing 0.7 atmospheres of oxygen during your dive, that can result in a bad uh, decompression calculation, as you can imagine. You need to check your PO2 frequently because your life depends on it, and it's a bit, that mantra is a bit like the old, you know, breathe normally, never hold your breath on open circuit scuba. It, it's, it's equivalent to that. It is the one thing that rebreather divers have hammered into them all the time. Check your PO2 because your life depends on it. There are many potential causes of hypoxia, hypoxia and hyperoxia, and both of those problems can sneak up on you and cause you to go unconscious with no warning. You need to be situationally aware. Rebreathers send you messages that are subtle, they're nuanced. It's not like open circuit scuba, so you need to be situationally aware. And you need to minimize exertion, because exertion on a rebreather where all the effort of moving gas around the circuit comes from your lungs, 
promotes carbon dioxide retention, and I'll talk about that in my physiology lecture. With the ascent, ascents on rebreathers are a potentially dangerous time because as you ascend, the pressure around you drops, the pressure in the loop drops, so the PO2 falls. Electronic closed circuit rebreathers will cope with that. Other forms of rebreathers, you normally have to add gas in some form or another to cope with the drop in PO2. But check the PO2 because your life depends on it. You need to be very conscious of maintaining minimal loop volume because otherwise the gas in the bag is going to expand and expand and expand and you'll become very buoyant. You need to be situationally aware, as I've already harped on about. Many of us will manually add oxygen to help the rebreather along. Even if it's an electronic rebreather and it's doing it automatically, you can add a little bit of oxygen, especially on the shallow stops, to help the rebreather maintain the PO2. And of course, on arriving at the surface, you need to shut your mouthpiece off and remove it, but shut it off before you remove it. Otherwise, you lose all the gas and you become negatively buoyant. So, here's a walkthrough a typical rebreather dive and some of the things that make it different to an open circuit dive. I want to make this point again and I want to make it very clearly. Rebreathers have facilitated many fabulous examples of exploration and discovery. They are, in short, a fabulous tool. However, they're complex devices, they're used by us fallible humans in a hostile, non-respirable environment. And so that is a heady mix for problems. And what we're about this weekend is critically looking at the way we use these devices, what the problems are, and trying to mitigate them. And once again, I'd like to congratulate the organisers on bringing together such a successful event. Thank you very much.